Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be solving the physics admission test for Oxford University, also known as the PAT test. Just before we get started though, just a little note that these are my solutions only because there are no official mark schemes that may or may not be correct. If you notice something that, if you notice a mistake that I might have made, please do get in touch. Additionally, um, all of these test resources can be found on the Oxford University website and I've left a link in the description so please check that one out. Also please note that in this video I'm only going to be solving the physics portion of the test so that is the questions which directly relate to the physics syllabus. Furthermore, if you have just stumbled across this uh, channel, one of the best preparations for the physics pad test is also doing some Olympiad problems. And if you're interested in having a look at some of my solutions, either to the International Physics Olympiad or the British Physics Olympiad, I've also left some links into the description. Okay, well now let's get started with the physics problems. So, question one. We have the following isotopes over here and we need to go through each of those statements and see which one are true and which one are false. So, this one here says that carbon-13 has a larger number of protons than carbon-12. This is incorrect. Once again, this question is all about the um, following way of expressing the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So if you have an element, let's say X, the uh, Z number just over here on the lower left hand corner, that's the number of protons, which in this case is the same. And the atomic number above here is the number of protons plus neutrons. So let's just say that this over here is the proton number and A is protons plus neutrons. Now that we've explained the main concept of this question, let's have a look at the uh, actual statements. So as we said, the first one is incorrect. Uh, carbon-13 has exactly the same number of protons as the uh, carbon number of protons in the carbon-12 atom as indicated by this lower index number. So statement one is false. Statement two, so 157N has a larger mass than 147N. Yes, that is correct because this isotope of nitrogen, nitrogen 15, will have an additional neutron compared to nitrogen 14. Statement three, so we have oxygen 16 has a larger nuclear charge than nitrogen 7. That is correct because it has one more proton in its nucleus compared to the nitrogen. The trick in this question is that it says nuclear charge because otherwise um, unless there are ions there would be electrically neutral so to have the same charge but in this case because it says nuclear charge I'm going to underline it this would mean that the statement is correct. Statement 4, so oxygen 18 has a large mass per unit charge compared to carbon 12. So this one here has 8 protons and has 10 neutrons, 18 nucleons in total. This one here has 6 neutrons and 6 protons. Now let's assume that the neutrons and protons are a similar mass and let's just divide the ratio, just overall mass per charge. I'm assuming that we're talking about the nucleus in this case, by the way. So the first one here will be just 18 over 8, which is 9 over 4. What's that going to be? It's going to be 2.25. So mass over charge for this one will be 2.25. For this one here will be 12 over 6 which is just 2. So this statement, statement 4, is correct. Statement 5, nitrogen 14 has a larger number of neutrons than carbon 13. Well this is incorrect. Nitrogen 14 is going to have 7 
neutrons, whereas carbon-13 is going to have 7 as well, so that's 13 minus 6, so the statement is incorrect. They have the same number of neutrons. Okay, question 3, which ammeter is going to give us the highest reading? So what we need to do is figure out which branch is going to have the lowest resistance. That will mean that if it has the lowest resistance, it's going to have the highest current and hence the highest reading of the ammeters. Okay, well, let's work out the equivalent resistance across branch number one. So we have a series and parallel combination. So the uh, total resistance across this branch will be given by R plus the parallel branch. We have 1 over R plus 1 over 2R raised to the power of minus 1. Then let's just do a little bit of algebra manipulation. So let's put this under a common denominator. So it's going to be 2 over 2r plus 1 over 2r raised to the power of minus 1. So it's going to be r plus uh, 3 over 2r raised to the power of minus 1. So that's going to give us r plus 2r over 3, like so, uh, because raising to the power of minus 1 is essentially just flipping the fraction. Let's put this under a common denominator, common denominator again, so it's going to be 3r over 3 plus 2r over 3, so that will be equal to 5r over 3 and 5 over 3 is just 1.67 to a couple of significant figures so that's 1.67 r so the overall resistance of this first parallel branch is 1.67 r the second branch is just r plus uh, plus a third of R because they're just in series. So this was for, for this branch, obviously over here. For this one, uh, it will be just 3 over 3R plus R over 3, which is, of course, 4 over 3R. Let's compare them directly. So I'm just going to write them out as decimals. So 4 over 3 is, of course, 1.33. So this one here is 1.33R, that's the middle branch, and E is 1.4. So this means that out of all of those uh, branches, branch D overall has the lowest resistance, which means that it's going to get the highest current. So the correct answer is D. So question five, if the gravitational field strength on the Earth's surface is GE, which is equal to 10, and uh, at a distance R, which is greater than, than this, it's two newtons per kilogram, what is the radius of the Earth RE in terms of R? Okay, well, let's write out a few equations. So we know in general that the gravitational field strength is given by minus gm over r squared, the radius squared. So let's say if we're on the surface of uh, the Earth, we're going to give that a subscript e, which means that the radius is going to be like so, mi minus gm over r e squared. If you're unsure where this equation comes from, you might have not done this part of the specification just yet. So I'm leaving a link in the description of my online lesson on this equation. So GE is equal to minus GM over RE squared. So we know when this is the radius of the Earth, GE is equal to 10 newtons per kilogram. So we could just literally write that 10 is equal to minus gm over re squared. Notice that minus gm is just a constant. So I can rearrange 
for minus gm, like so. We're going to see in a second why you can do that. Minus gm will be equal to 10 multiplied by re squared. And this is all from um, this is all based on the equation of the gravitational field strength on the surface of the Earth. Now let's do exactly the same expression at a distance r from the center, where the gravitational field strength, let's call that gr, is 2 newtons per kilogram. So once again our formula is minus gm divided by r squared. So at that distance we have a gravitational field strength of 2, and that's going to be minus gm over r squared. We're nearly done. Now, look at that. Minus gm, we could substitute that directly into this equation. And what we're going to get, because it's a constant, which means that it's the same across both equations, it's just minus g times uh, m, where m is the mass of the Earth. So, 2 will be equal to, rather than minus gm, I'm going to write 10 times re squared. So 10 times re squared divided by r squared. Okay, we're nearly done. What I'm going to do is just rearrange, let's say, for r. And what we're going to get is that r squared is equal to 10 over 2 r e squared like so so r squared will be equal to 5 r e squared in this equation we need to find the radius of the earth in terms of r so we need to rearrange for r e squared r e squared will be equal to 1 over 5 times r squared and we can just square root this and what we're going to get is that r e will be equal to r divided by the square root of 5. So this means that the correct answer is d. Question 7. What is the order from shortest to longest of the wavelengths of the peak EM radiation from each of the following objects? Here are some assumptions. Let's assume that the electric torch uh, mainly releases a uh, line across the visible part of the spectrum, microwave oven based uh, obviously in the microwave part of the spectrum, radioactive source will be producing gamma radiation, a hot cooking stove will be mainly producing infrared radiation and a radio transmitter radio. So short to long, gamma is the shortest, visible after that, infrared, microwave and radio wavelengths are the longest. A couple of tips to just kind of help us remember. So in this case, the answer is A. However, if you have other similar questions, a few things to remember. So visible is sort of somewhere between 400 to 700 nanometers. Gamma is obviously the shortest and between uh, visible we have infrared. Microwaves is of the order of a few centimeters typically and radio wavelengths are the longest which range from sort of 10 centimeters and above all the way up to many meters. Okay, question 11. We have a stone of an average diameter 10 centimeters is hit with a hammer and then split into pieces. So every time the stone or one of its pieces is hit, it splits into three further pieces of equal volume and similar shape. How many hits will it take before a piece reaches the size of a typical atom? Now, a really, really good number to remember is that the we can assume that the average size of the atomic radius is about 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. So this is a very valid assumption. Let's write it down here once again, 10 to the power of minus 10. Okay, well, for the purposes of this video, I've just assumed that the original stone is a sphere, and every time, it's, um, every time you strike it, you get um, another three spheres with a third of the volume. Now, how is the radius related to the volume? Because v is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed, well, this means that the radius 
is proportional to v raised to the power of a third. How do we get that? Well, r will be, let's say r cubed will be 3 uh, v over 4 pi, like that, which of course means that if we were to cube root, root everything, we are going to get this factor raised to the power of a third. So it's going to be 3v over 4 pi, all of it uh, raised to the power of a third. So r is proportional to v to the power of a third. This means that if we were to essentially decrease the radius by a factor of a third, then r is going to decrease by the following a factor, which is 1 over 3, a third, this comes from splitting the volume into three equal pieces, raised to the power of a third, which is approximately 0 0.69. So the radius is about 0, with, each, with each strike, the, it, the radius becomes 0 0.69 of the previous radius. Let's assume that we're starting with, uh, with original radius of 5 centimeters. Remember here we're given the diameter, which is 10 centimeters, so I've just halved it to get 5 times 10 to the power of minus 2. Each time we strike the object, we're getting a factor of 0.69. The question is, how many times do we need to do that until we reach the atomic radius, which is 10 to the power of minus 10? So essentially, how many times do we strike it? This means essentially what is that power n here going to be? So 5, 5 times 10 to the power of minus 2 times 0.69 raised to the power of n is equal to 10 to the power of minus 10. Rearranging for 0.69 to the power of n, we get that 0.69 to the power of n is equal to 10 to the power of minus 10 divided by five centimeters. I've carefully put it some brackets here because this is how we would put that into a calculator. Then we can use some basic logarithms and we get that the number n will be equal to log of a base 0.69 of the following 10 to the power of minus 10 over five centimeters or five times 10 to the power of minus two. Okay, um, this would give us a uh, number n which is 55, so it's not exactly the answer, but we're going to go one above that. It's uh, for a correct answer, D. This is relatively natural as well, because I also approximated this, uh, this fraction to be 0 0.69, and logarithms and exponentials actually are incredibly sensitive to initial conditions, so uh, a few more digits here will probably bring that to the correct answer. But by 56 strikes for sure, we would have reached the, uh, the atomic radius. Okay guys, well this was part one of this uh, video, otherwise this video will be really really long. Thank you very much for watching, I hope this was useful. If you do spot any mistakes or inaccuracies, do let me know and I'll see you guys in the next video.